weekend, the Ghostbusters were back in business in the Big Apple with Frozen Empire. That means it's time to stop and rank all five Ghostbusters movies from the worst to the best. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Share your ranking of all five Ghostbusters movies. My ranking isn't the right ranking, it's just my ranking and I would love to see yours. Also, I'd like to recommend the book, A Convenient Parallel Dimension, How Ghostbusters Slimed Us Forever. Basically, it's a behind the scenes book on the making of the entire Ghostbusters franchise. I listened to it over the last couple of weeks in preparation for Frozen Empire coming out and making this video great insight into the entire franchise. You can listen to it for free if you sign up for a free trial of Audible at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. I do recommend the book and I do use Audible. Link is down below in the description and let's get started. In last place, Ghostbusters 2016. And I am one of the few people on planet Earth that can honestly say Ghostbusters 2016 changed my life for the better. If you don't know, Sean Chandler talks about started in July of 2016 when I went to go see Lady Ghostbusters on a date night with my wife. Yes, this is the actual picture that we took that night with the Snapchat filter on. And I went home the next day and the online discourse surrounding the film was, if you like the film, it's because you're an idiot. And if you don't like the film, it's because you're a sexist. And I thought, maybe there's room for a slightly more nuanced take on the film. And I posted my very first review under Sean Chandler Talks About in this channel that changed my life and career trajectory was born. Now, if you watch this as a Paul Feig ghost comedy with his usual ladies joining in, it's not one of his stronger films, but it's silly and harmless. But it's not just a Paul Feig ghost comedy. It's Ghostbusters, and as a Ghostbusters movie, it's a disaster and a huge disappointment for lifelong Ghostbusters fans. Now, to understand why this movie was so rejected, by so many people at such a deep emotional level when it came out. You have to keep in mind that many of us had been waiting for a new Ghostbusters movie for 25 years when this film came out. And for over 20 years, Dan Aykroyd had been publicly saying he was writing a Ghostbusters 3, and at one point in time, he's going to have Chris Farley, and going to have Ben Stiller, and they were going to go to hell, and then he kept reworking it, and then around the late zeros, some of the writers from The Office came in, and they worked on a draft for it, and it was very publicly being discussed that they were trying to get Bill Murray to sign on, and he wasn't, and he wasn't in it. This went on all the way up until mid-2014, after Harold Ramis had died. We'd been waiting for Ghostbusters 3 with the original cast. And so, when very suddenly it shifts and Paul Feig is going to do a total reboot, um, and he's going to bring in his ladies from Bridesmaids and a couple people from Saturday Night Live to make his version of Ghostbusters it felt like we'd been cheated and we'd been waiting for something that was never going to happen. There's a sense of loss in that. And that kind of defines some, obviously there's sexists out there and weirdos that troll the internet trying to spark up hatred. But there's a bunch of very normal people that were like, this isn't what I waited for. So when you take the movie, as it is, I think Chris Hemsworth is the funniest person in the entire movie. I think he's a very funny actor. Can I ask why no, no glass? Oh, uh, yeah, they just kept getting dirty, so I took them out. Uh, I'm not crazy about Kate McKinnon just being weird in the background or Leslie Jones just shouting, Get out of my friend, ghost! But overall, I think the movie just fails to feel like Ghostbusters. The original two Ghostbusters were intentionally shot to not look like a comedy, to not look feel like a comedy. Paul Feig's film feels like a comedy. It looks like a comedy. Characters behave like they're in a comedy. And that's just not Ghostbusters. It doesn't feel right. It feels like a lesser Paul Feig comedy. Adding to that, 
in typical modern blockbuster fashion, there's, it feels like they feel obligated to just crank everything up to 11. So the PKE meters have all these spinning wild things. There's all of these different gadgets. Let's go. They do fantastical things. Everything looks like a cartoon. And we're adding just even more juvenile humor where we're shooting the, the ghost monster in the, the balls to like take it out. Yo, that's where you wanted us to shoot, right? Yes! Just a lot of things like this that just break the, the sense of groundedness that was in the original run of Ghostbusters films. Like, I don't hate this movie. It's just not a good Ghostbusters movie. Number four, Ghostbusters 2. And this has always been a tricky one for me because on the one hand, it's great that we have more of the original Ghostbusters. The original cast returned, the director returned, writing team returned. It has the aesthetic, the vibe of the original film. More of the original is the best and worst thing about this movie because on the other hand, very clearly, there simply wasn't the inspiration here that was in the original film. Everyone's back, but it feels a bit like they're going through the motions and they chose a story and plot line that feels like the safest and most risk averse path that they could take and thus it's kind of the least interesting. Bill Murray has made many quotes that have been disparaging of this film, but in one quote he specifically said, they got us all together and they pitched a story idea that was really great. I thought, holy cow, we could make that work. But by the time we got to shooting it, I showed up on set and went, what the hell is this? What is this thing? A big part of the problem with the film for me is that they chose to start off with the Ghostbusters basically out of business, washed up has-beens. A couple of them are doing birthday parties. We got one doing research. We got one hosting a TV show. But five years later, they're a joke. And so they have to like get back together, earn the respect of the town again, in which case it feels like we're just rehashing what we did in the first film rather than continuing and expanding and building on the foundation that was laid before. And I could forgive some of that, if it was still really funny and had a bunch of really clever, witty ideas, but it's just not quite as funny this time. The lines quite, aren't quite as sharp. Bill Murray, he's not quite as on. His dry wit doesn't hit like it did before. It's not bad, but it's just not as fresh. It doesn't work quite as much. It lacks that spark of life that infused every scene in the original Film. And there are also just some simply goofy ideas in here. Do re -mi -gong. Where our main villain is weakened because people outside start singing. <laughs> That's just not a great idea. There's still plenty of iconic, memorable things in this movie. The painting, River of Slime, Statue of Liberty, Toaster Dancing, Courtroom Scene. They're all memorable. There's good stuff in here. When you have a great director working with great writers with a great cast and a great concept, there's plenty of fun to be had. It's watchable. You know, I've seen the movie 20, 25 times in my life, but it's far removed from the original one and I think it could have been better if they'd just taken more risks, if they'd gone dug a little bit deeper and if they were just more excited to make the movie and unfortunately it seems like they just weren't and they just played it safe. Today's video is brought to you by Factor. I'm in a crazy busy phase of life right now and it's so easy to default to just eating junk out of convenience. <laughs> But eating better is easy with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to go in just two minutes. Factor's meals are restaurant quality and they're ready to heat and eat whenever you are. No prep, no cooking skills required, and no cleanup. You'll have 35 different options to choose from every week, including calorie-smart, 
protein plus and keto. I usually go for keto because I'm a high protein, low carb kind of guy. There's also more than 60 add-ons you can help to stay energized and feeling good all day long. In particular, I like their coffee flavored protein shake. I like to start my day with one of those. Get as much or as little as you need by choosing your meals every week. Plus you can pause or reschedule your deliveries any time. Head to factormeals.com slash Sean Chandler 50 and use code Sean Chandler 50 to get 50% off. That's code Sean Chandler 50 at factormeals.com slash Sean Chandler 50 to get 50% off. And back to the Ghostbusters. In third place is Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. And this is a movie that I had a lot of fun with and it felt like the Ghostbusters film I've been waiting for for decades. Before the film came out, the creators said that they intentionally wanted this film to feel a little bit like the real Ghostbusters animated show that I grew up watching. <laughs> And I think this movie is able to capture that a good bit. Every other Ghostbusters film is about starting or restarting the Ghostbusters. This is the only one where the Ghostbusters are in action from the very beginning of the film. And that means they're just able to expand the lore, build out kind of the resources and teams tied to the Ghostbusters. They're able to kind of dive into the history of different ways ghosts have been captured in the past. And I just enjoyed all of those elements of this film. As always, the cast is a lot of fun. I think McKenna Grace is a standout. I think she's going to have a long career. She's incredibly talented. But also, I like the way that Ray and Winston were used in this movie where Ray feels like the proud grandpa that l misses the old days but loves that there's new people kind of carrying on the torch and then Winston is kind of like the CEO of the Ghostbusters this kind of in charge of what's going on. I love the way they kind of built out his character. Now, as much as I enjoyed the characters, the setting, the setup, and the basic idea of the story here, I also feel like they shot the first draft of the script. There's a lot of kind of issues with the pacing. It takes way too long for things to get going. There's way too many characters. There's too many subplots. And so it feels very spread out and cluttered while not really having all that complex of a story at the exact same time. And it's a movie where pretty clearly they did a lot of reworking in the editing. There's this whole shot that's the payoff of the original trailer that has Paul Rudd up on the roof in an orange jacket going, whoa! <laughs> he never goes to the roof in the movie, so something happened where they redid the whole third act of the movie at some point in time, and you feel that. And so a lot of people were really disappointed by this, this film, and I can understand a lot of that. I, I can appreciate a lot of the criticism. I've seen other people saying it's terrible, it's the worst film in a decade, and I'm like, what on earth are you talking about? But it is flawed, but I had a lot of fun spending more time in the world of Ghostbusters and expanding the lore here. Our runner-up, Ghostbusters Afterlife, and to be perfectly clear, I love this movie. That's great! For me, this is exactly what the Ghostbusters franchise needed to get back on track. In a lot of ways, it's something brand new for the franchise. It's about a family moving to Oklahoma because a family member died. And at the same time, it's very true to the original Ghostbusters. For some of you, a little bit too true to the original Ghostbusters, a little bit too derivative. For me, it's the perfect mix of the familiar with something very new and different. In particular, this is the most character-based and emotional of the Ghostbusters films. The original Ghostbusters, the characters are great, but like we don't know anything about their personal lives. It's not like it's about big, gigantic character arcs. But with this film, it's all about about the transformation that these characters go on with a little girl connecting with a grandfather that she never knew and understanding herself more because of that. It's about a daughter that feels abandoned by her father. And through the course of the film, she realizes that while her dad was flawed, he still deeply cared about her. It's very reverent towards the original Ghostbusters in a way that pulls out big, gigantic emotions 
you just don't have that in any of the other Ghostbusters movies, then it makes the movie stand out. You know, in my theater when I first watched it, a lot of people in the theater were crying, and even Bill Murray himself mentioned some tears were shed. Everyone that has seen it says that they cry at the movie, so it should be a, an extremely successful comedy. <laughs> And the reason that that's so important and so powerful is Ghostbusters is a franchise that for many of us has been with us our entire lives, going back 35, 40 years since the original came out. And we have such deep emotional ties to it. So when you are able to tell a Ghostbusters story that taps into those connections, it makes for a special experience for the audience, and that's what I felt this movie was able to do. Beyond that, I think the comedy works here. That's kind of natural, grounded, character-based comedy that rolls out of the personality of the characters. I think Paul Rudd is a fantastic addition to the franchise that fits that type of comedy perfectly, where he just has a natural way of being amusing without it feeling like he's in a comedy. I think McKenna Grace is great, as I mentioned before. She's absolutely the star of this new set of films, and she's able to feel like Egon Spangler as this little girl. She's able to be funny, emotional, all the things that she needs to do. This, to me, was... This is one of the great legacy sequels that we've gotten that was able to tap into something really, really special. It was one of my most anticipated movies the year it came out, and it was one of my favorite movies the year it came out. Coming in at number one, the original Ghostbusters. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. I have watched it countless times, and actually back in January, I was in LA for an awards show, and I stayed at the hotel where the hotel sequence was filmed at in this film, which was just a very cool experience. But when it comes to this movie, it's one of these classic lightning in a bottle situations where they had this great idea and the right talent got involved at the right time to just make something very special. And it was a true collaboration. In the book I mentioned at the beginning of this video about the making of the Ghostbusters franchise, they talk about Dan Aykroyd's original concepts and they're, they're way far out there. But as Ivan Reitman got involved and Harold Ramis got involved, all of their skills together were able to make something that was so accessible while being very weird. It could be funny while being spooky and it could feel grounded while obviously being very fantastical. A big part of that is the fact that they, they made a movie that's really funny. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. But it plays it straight. It doesn't look or feel like a comedy, it's just people being funny. So much of that is Bill Murray's just dry wit, his responses to everything going on, his friends, everything, just makes for something special. It's a true genre bender where it doesn't neatly fit into one genre. It's a big spectacle film. It's a comedy. It's a spooky ghost story. All of those at the same time. In a lot of ways, this is the original big special effects comedy. And that's kind of what most blockbusters have turned into now, where you look at the MCU, they're big, gigantic spectacle films and they're comedies. And that goes back to Ghostbusters 40 years ago this year. A big part of what elevates this film is right out of the gate, it establishes this core group of characters and they just balance each other out really nicely. Where you have the excitable Ray, you have the nerdy Egon, and then you have the totally uninterested but plugged in Venkman. Venkman, what happened? Are you okay? He slimed me. And they balance each other out really nicely. Like this is a movie that is jam packed with exposition where in most movies that would kill the film, but those exposition scenes shine in this movie as you watch each of the different ways that Ray, Egon, and Venkman, and then at the end of the film, Winston respond to all of this. It's highly entertaining. Everything in this movie is memorable. Something I loved from my childhood. Something that could never ever possibly destroy us. Mr. Stay Puft. Nice thinking, Ray. 
everyone stands out, whether you're talking about Slimer, Rick Moranis, Stay Puffed, Marshmallow Man, everything in it is iconic and memorable and holds up 40 years later where my five-year-old loves the Ghostbusters song and wants to listen to it all the time. Or when we rewatched the movie a week ago, my 11-year-old was laughing as he discovers just how funny Bill Murray is. This is one of the great blockbusters of all time. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It established this franchise that I love. So it comes in at number one. If you're interested in delicious meals delivered right to your front door, check out Factor at the link in the description. I do recommend that book about the making of the Ghostbusters franchise. Once again, got that link down below in the description of how you can get it for free with a free trial of Audible. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too.